uh, to everyone for uh, coming along today. Uh, this is the final OERC seminar for 2021. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Alan Corley. Uh, Alan has had a long 30-year uh, career in research and development uh, with key skills in computer-aided engineering, fluid-related machinery, and manufacturing. Alan works at Callahan Innovation, where he is a team leader of uh, Callahan Innovation's mechanical engineering team. Alan's currently involved with uh, an MBIE Advanced Energy Technology Platforms uh, program with title High Power Electric Motors for Large Scale Transport, which is a seven year program. So today, Alan's going to uh, present a summary of um, this case, of this program for the case of electric aircraft and a summary of the uh, MBIE Advanced Energy Technology program that he is involved with. Uh, so uh, this is uh, very important energy research specifically for transitioning our energy systems. So I'd like to uh, thank Alan for preparing the seminar for us today and um, please take it a, take away, Alan. Okay, thanks, Sam. That was good. Um, as a little bit more of an introduction, um, the well, going way back into the 2000s, industrial research had a super, superconductivity team and I was part of that team doing the cryogenic refrigeration side of things and when Callahan was formed and the superconductivity people left for Victoria University um, the cryogenic team stayed with Callahan but we have been contracted back into this program as a key part of the work. Um, I'll just share my screen and get the presentation going. So I think that is up and running. You can see it. So the the big question or the big thing is the um, move to electric aviation as part of the um, sort of the the electrification of everything that's going on in the world. Right. So we'll look at sort of the first question of why electric aviation, and then. Uh, move on to the electric drivetrain, talk a little bit about that, and um, then move on to the project and what we're doing in the, um, the high, power, high power density motors for large scale transport project. So everyone seems to want electric. Um, these things have been flooding the, the media lately. Um, even Air New Zealand has announced that by 2030 they are going to be adding electric aircraft to the fleet. Now that's really ambitious um, goals here because um, the, the, the job of converting an aircraft to electric is much, much harder than it is for doing a car or a motorbike or a truck or something. Um, and the reason for electric aviation, um, well, the answer is um, COVID aside, use of aviation is increasing and aviation is having an effect on the environment. Um, it's a significant contributor to um, CO2 and greenhouse gases, but it's not only just how much is being dumped into the atmosphere, it's where it's being dumped. And at high altitude, the chemistry is different. So things like contrails become important um, and what they do, some of the things warm, some cool. There are re secondary reactions that happen. Um, and for New Zealand to reduce its carbon emissions to 30% of 2005 levels by 2030, we've got to address aviation somehow. Um, our New Zealand context is quite unique um, with 90% of our electricity renewable and, sus and sustainable. Um, transport also accounts for 20% of our emissions, which is mostly fossil fuel driven. Um, but our transport routes are quite long and skinny. We've got no fast electric rail network, or in fact, we don't have a particularly good um, highway network for that matter. Um, aviation is really the only rapid transport option we have, but in aviation terms, our routes are short hop. Short hop. They are barely reach cruising altitude. Um, so aviation could have a big, big, make a big difference, but how do we do it? How much power is needed? How do we store the energy? How do we use it? These are the sort of questions we're grappling with. Um, 
when you look at an electric propulsion system, um, weight means everything for an aircraft. Um, the more weight, the more power you're required to is required to keep the plane in the air. So it's a it's a huge part of the equation. Um, electricity can help with things like propulsive efficiency um, because you can have smaller fans. You can change different fan layouts for the propulsion. You can have a more efficient um, flying body. And also there's drivetrain efficiencies that can be done with um, electrical drivetrains. But those things all have to happen with a minimal weight increase. And the only way to get the weight down for electric motors on aircraft is to go to superconducting motors. Um, small aircraft, you can get conventional room temperature motors, but um, for large aircraft, the sort of powers you need, the only way to do it with the required weight is superconducting. Um, so the first one is to start looking at simulating the aircraft power powertrains and the effects that sort of modifications of that powertrain have on total um, efficiency. So um, Robinson Research have been doing some work um, modeling flights and modeling the fuel burn, the energy required, um, the powertrains. Um, they've got some flight simulator They've used real flight data from Air New Zealand. They've been able to calculate the fuel burn of a 737 to within about 1% of the actual measured fuel burn. So there's some very accurate flight modelling that can be done. And then that modelling is used to um, look at various different electrification scenarios. And hybridisation of the flight is actually quite a, an attractive thing. Um, if you look at... Do you see my mouse? There. Okay, if you look at a typical flight, you, you climb, you cruise, and then you descend. Um, and the power required on that, most of the power is required on the climb, you a lesser amount through cruise, and then not very much at all in the descent. So if you do a hybrid um, drivetrain, your thermal engine can, can do a, a steady cruise um, load, and you can have a smaller um, engine for that and run it at its efficient cruise um, power. And then you can use an electric um, option, a smaller electric option to actually boost it. And for that, you can reduce the fuel flow. So there's some really good scenarios that you might work with um, on an electric drivetrain. So how would you do that? There's uh, the conventional, all the different ways of doing hybrids, um, powertrains, the conventional one, which is this top left one here, would have your typical gas turbine and uh, an electric motor with a gearbox onto the shaft to give it some boost power to drive the fan. So you could do it that way. You could do a full series turbo electric where you would house the generator with the turbine somewhere else and then have fans and motors where it's convenient or best for propulsive efficiency. Um, you could do a partial series. You could actually have um, a gas turbine and a generator with a fan on it, driving another fan if you need it with some stored energy in between, or you could go fully electric. There's different options available. Um, the other big question people have is, are we going to go um, for hydrogen? You know, why would you do that? Um, in my opinion, um, this is only my opinion, but almost certainly um, hydrogen's the highest de power density fuel for weight there is and um, use of hydrogen around the place is starting to grow so people are starting to get used to using it. Um, it can be generated using renewable energy um, and it generated from water. Um, mostly liquid hydrogen is being considered. Um, that's to get the, the size density of the hydrogen up. Um, and although BMW did some work a number of years ago about cryocompressed hydrogen, where at 50 Kelvin and high pressure, it was actually higher, possible to get a higher density than liquid hydrogen. So there's, you know, quite a few options being played with there. Um, hydrogen could either be burnt directly in a turbine um, or used with fuel cells and batteries in a hybrid kind of situation. Um, with hydrogen, the tanks are larger the lighter but the larger so 
um, different aircraft geometries need to be considered. And you've got a few options here um, showing a, quite a bulbous top on a conventional aircraft shape to hold the tanks or Airbus's idea of having a flying wing um, as a single body. Um, this blue plane down here is actually a flying plane that's got a fuel cell and an electric motor on it. So these things are starting to be played with. So some of it real, some of it conceptual at the moment. Um, one thing hydrogen does, and liquid hydrogen in particular, um, it gives you a cold source. Um, so if you do run a, a um, cryogenic system, you've got this great um, heat sink of cold that you can play with. And of course it needs to be heated up somehow. Um, the amount of energy you're talking about is actually really, really high um, and the power you're talking about for an aircraft. So this, this graph here sort of gives you some perspectives on the battery electrics, you know, the Purius and the Teslas sitting down the bottom. Um, a Cessna might um, come into the kind of onboard power and um, that you would have for a light aircraft and there are, have been light aircraft battery electrics that have been built. Um, but as you go up to the typical Q400 or 737, you're getting up to some fairly serious amounts of power stored and amounts of power used. And as a comparison, frigates um, are sitting at less, the same sort of stored power, but less actual delivered power um, than your typical large aircraft. So um, an aircraft requires your onboard storage, but it also requires massive power flows to refuel it quickly. So you start to think of um, the airport as an energy hub. Um, and a recent um, study that was presented at the Cryogenic Engineering Conference this year calculated that Charles de Gaulle's airport in Paris needed about 12 gigawatts of energy generation to provide enough liquid hydrogen to refuel the aircraft that go through that airport. And as a comparison for that, their largest nuclear power station in France was seven gigawatts. So um, when you start talking about how do we fuel aircraft, how do we just provide the energy raw to the aircraft, you're talking about sizing a large nuclear power station next to your airport. And that's the kind of scale that you would be talking about. Um, so this is, you know, the question, how do you get the power to the plane? Um, these things are all part of the equation that you've got to think of for electric aircraft. At the moment, it's pretty simple. Um, you sort of dig your, your fuel up from the ground or you know, if you've got a, a green fuel, you might use biomass, you'd refine it so it's nice, take it to the airport and fill the plane. Um, with battery electric, you would generate somewhere either on site or off site and then charge the airplane. But again, think of those massive power flows that have got to go into the airplane because it wants to spend 20 minutes on the ground for every hour flying for a short hop plane. So it's huge power flows. With hydrogen, it's a bit more. Um, possible, you'd use electrolysis. Um, Off-site, you'd probably pipe it, the gas to the airport, you'd liquefy it on-site um, because liquefaction has a high energy cost, but once it's liquefied, it starts to boil off. So you only want to liquefy on demand. Um, then you'd have some storage there and fill the airplanes. Um, another one that's been talked about um, is a synthetic fuel. So you would use electrolysis um, from some power generator, um, combine it with carbon capture and cr basically create a synthetic liquid fuel out of that. Then you can transport it with a conventional um, process to fuel airplanes. And you'll probably find some version of this will be the first step off the block for greening the aircraft fleet when you're starting to use more and more synthetic fuel um, to produce a, a carbon neutral um, fuel for aircraft. Doesn't solve all the problems, but it solves some of them. So this brings us to the project. Um, so what we're looking at is high power density electric motors for large scale transport. 
aircraft is what we're aiming at, but these could equally be useful as well. The technology could equally be useful for rail or shipping um, or large heavy road transport. So we're open to those, but at the moment the aircraft's the tough nut. So we're going to try and produce the technology for that. Um, the technology problem. So um, you've got fully superconducting machines. There's one thing we've got to deal with. There's the cryogenic systems on the, um, for the machines, because they're fully superconducting as a cryogenic machine. So you've got a, a, a cryogenic, you've got to keep it cold. Um, power electronics are important because if you've got an electric engine, you've got to actually produce the control. That slide automatically jumped. Um, and then we've also got to address industry and actually get industry ready to deal with these machines when they come. Likely they're going to come from an external providers from overseas, but we still in New Zealand have to actually have enough knowledge about these machines to deal with them. So we structured the program around that um, for, um, for work streams, one in superconducting machines, one in cryogenics, power electronics, and then industry training capabilities. And in each side, there are multiple players, but Victoria University is the key um, research organization that's coordinating it all, which is why this is on a Victoria University header. Um, so first program, superconducting machines, See, I'm running low on time already. Um, so the first pro program, Victoria University, University of Auckland involved, Kyoto, um, and I think that's Cambridge. The Cambridge are in that block. Um, they, Robinson have already built a number of high-speed superconducting motors um, and machines. Um, and this motor will be a, a sort of a, another iteration on the experience I've had. Another key thing is um, flux pumps, which I'll get to a bit later. Um, the motor design at the moment, we're looking at a four and a half thousand RPM, 100 kilowatt demonstrator. We've got to get down to, or I mean up to and above 20 kilowatts per kilogram, which includes the cryogenic system of the motor as well, which is a real challenge. Um, the rotor coil is probably going to be high temperature superconductor, a, a coated conductor, and the stator coils are looking like magnesium diboride. Um, and there's, there's very good physics reasons for those things. And then, of course, you've got to keep the two sides of the motor cold at different temperatures. Um, so that's the stator coils. We're doing saddle coils. There's no iron in this motor. We've got to keep the weight down, which means high magnetic fields are going to be flying around this thing. Um, but one of the key problems with the, these coils is AC loss. Um, even though it's superconducting, there's no resistance in the conductor. Um, when you put an AC current in, you are making a magnetic field and dropping the magnetic field, and you get a hysteresis loss in the dielectric of that. Um, and that turns into a heat loss or a heat load in the coils, which can be significant. Um, so there's quite a lot of work going on about AC loss measurement and reduce ways of reducing the AC loss. You can reduce it by making lots of little filaments, winding them up. Um, it reduces the size of the coil, the field each filament produces. Um, and different types of materials. Um, magnesium diboride is an interesting in between low temperature and high temperature superconductor material that works um, around the li liquid hydrogen temperatures. Um, the other key problem is on the rotating side of it. Um, you have a superconducting coil that you have to keep a DC current in, and how do you do that? Um, so you want to do it without a feel or a feed through. You don't want to um, have a wire coming from the warm environment into the cold one, which is a heat lo heat load and a resistance loss because you can't make that wire superconducting. Um, so we've been talking about flux pumps, which basically um, my analogy is if you've got a swimming pool and you want to make the water 
swirl in a big pattern. You get your hand, you give it a bit of a push every now and then, and you just start it swirling. And if there's no resistance, then it will just get faster and faster. And so flux pumps work like that. Um, and there's a number of types of flux pumps. There's the old transformer rectifier type where you can split a transformer from the warm to the cold side of the machine or the traveling wave one, which is like sort of giving the, um, giving the pull a bit of a push and just getting the flow moving inside there. And again, Robinson have done quite a bit of work um, making various types of dynamo um, flux pumps. And then when you put a, it inside a motor, you got that blue side as, as the rotor coils and you would have the flux pump sitting, that's a green part on either side of the um, cryogenic insulation, the cryostat. And the magnetic field is what transfers the energy through. Moving on to the second um, work stream of cryogenic system. So this is the bit that I'm involved with. Um, so we're looking at system optimization, heat transfer, additive manufacture, and cryo cryo cooler. That's the refrigerator development, and also looking at liquid hydrogen fuel synergies. So we've done modelling of the big system models of where the heat goes in and out of this um, machine on your rotor and stator sides. Uh, we've been playing with additive manufacture and heat exchanges, um, seeing if we can get more complex geometries. And another one is to be able to combine the heat exchange uh, with structural elements in the machine. So using the additive manufacture to be able to combine items. And we're working with AUT on this one um, and a master's student. This is his work. For the um, motor layout and the cryo cooler, we've been investigating having a rotating cryo cooler. So you're spinning your refrigerator at 6,000 RPM and then poking the cold end of the refrigerator into the motor to cool the rotor coils. That's the big challenge. And you're talking about here 20 watts for refrigeration at 50K, which isn't a lot, requires a kilowatt or so at the other end, at the other end, but it's, um, getting chased along by the auto thing. But the stator is another challenge because you've got about a kilowatt of refrigeration required at 20 Kelvin. And this is where your liquid hydrogen comes in. And power electronics, you're not far from the end now. I can't talk a lot about power electronics, um, but basically you need um, switches to control the frequency of the motor because um, when you're talking about a variable speed motor drive, you're talking about switching electronics and you've got some large currents going through the machine. If you can ship those electronics onto the cryogenic side of the machine, there are um, efficiency gains to be had out of the switching. And um, so this piece of work starts looking at, at the, um, Gallion arsenide, I think it is, switches for um, for doing the switching and how to run these at cryogenic temperatures. And the last part of the program um, is the training and industry ready capability. So we're working with ARA and Manukau Institute of Technology starting to develop the course content for level six courses. So you've got technicians who are capable and have some understanding of a cryogenic or a superconducting system. So that in five or 10 years time, when these things come out, you've got a, a body of people in New Zealand able to actually use these. And um, they actually know about electric drives, they know about power supplies and everything. And so that's through student internships as well as um, advisory panels and, um, their involvement. And then we've got um, tech boot camps. So we've got a vision Mataranga component to the project as well. And that is the project ready for questions. Uh, hi, uh, I was curious about the uh, hydrogen side of it. Um, I've yep. been hearing a lot about hydrogen's difficulty as a fuel in terms of it 
leaking out of whatever vessel it's stored in just through the container walls, does cryogenic hydrogen have less of that issue? Um, it's, yeah, it, it's not been a big issue that I've seen in the literature. Um, it will have less of that issue because you've got to generally pack a hard vacuum between the hydrogen container and which is at 20 Kelvin and the um, and the outside wall of the cryostat uh, because because of 20 Kelvin you've got to reduce your heat loads right down so you'll be pulling a hard vacuum right so essentially the, the whole storage vessel is going to be have to kind of be like a thermos uh, very much so yeah right yeah and most of them are, most of them are that they take varying amounts of pressures um, BMW did a very good system um, with a composite tanks and the cryo compressed hydrogen so it could take high pressure cryogenic hydrogen as well um, but what you have in all those sorts of systems you will have boil off and venting anyway and that'll be more significant than any seepage through the walls. Right, I'll cheers for that. That makes sense. Are there any other questions? You can also feel free to yeah. um, uh, write them in the chat box as well. If somebody else has got access to the yeah. chat box. Yeah, I can I can yeah. see it here. Yeah. yeah. I can race back through the um, slide pack if you want to talk about anything else in particular. I'll just move it back to the program. Um can I just um, make yeah, a comment, sorry. I guess? Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, we've just heard that we've uh, gained uh, um, funding from both German and New Zealandians to, to do uh, a lot of team build building between Germany and New Zealand on green hydrogen. So I was really oh, yeah. pleased to see your comments there about the fact that um, yeah, there are going to be horses for courses. So hydrogen is part of the energy future, not the only thing, obviously, yeah. and not the answer to everything either. But um, yeah, thanks for that. That was really interesting, and it would be no nice to meet up with you sometime when I'm up uh, your yeah. way. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah it would. Um, hydrogen's an interesting beast because if yeah. you look about at the round trip efficiency for producing hydrogen, mm -hmm. and then getting the energy back out of it, it's not super high. Um, sure. Batteries are be the best round trip efficiency. Cryo compressed, or cryogenic um, air storage. So liquid air storage is better than hydrogen, um, but there's very much a horses for courses. Exactly. Um, mm. And some things we, I mean, the jury's still out. The aircraft may still run on a liquid fuel because it's just the whole package is better. Um, but Can I just comment on that one yeah. though? Yeah, because the, the liquid fuel thing, I mean, you're quite likely in the future to need hydrogen to make those liquid fuels anyway. Yes. Yes, so it's integral to that too. So, but, yeah. But again, you would only use those liquid fuels when you really need a liquid fuel because you're going to be losing a large amount of the energy that you, you know, you lose 40% of the energy in your electrolysis. Um, and then you will lose probably half of it if you're going to combine it with CO2 to produce a liquid fuel. So that liquid fuel is going to be extremely high value fuel. Um, and you would use oh, it but if, you need if it. we stop if we stop digging it out of the ground we're gonna to have to make it so we're gonna to have to suck some of that up right yeah, <laughs> yeah we I, are. I, I, honestly it's yeah. it's another huge transition for the world to make like from the horse and cart to car yeah um it's gonna to have to change again and mm. therefore yes i agree these things aren't free in energy terms if you're going to make chemical bonds to store the energy it's going to cost you something um but yeah. you know what's the choice yeah. yeah okay anyway yeah great thank you and i look forward to meeting you sometime thank you okay. really enjoyed your talk Thanks. On the note of uh, horses for courses, um, the slide you were showing us about different concepts for hybrid powertrains, what kind of, is there an idea at this stage of what sort of size class of aircraft this might be going into, or is it more get yeah. powertrain working and then design a plane around it? Um, we're sort of targeting the 737 type small hop or short hop carrier. So the single, was it single aisle? Um, aircraft that seems to be right. a big or, or, or an achievable but 
large amount of use. Although in saying that the the long haul aircraft are very much in sight because long haul is a large portion of the um, the amount of air, aviation fuel that's burned is actually long haul flights. So um, they're targeting those things. The small aircraft, which if you, is it the next slide? Of this size, the small commuter aircraft, battery electrics or fuel cells could well be part of that equation. So again, horses for courses. Um, but when you're talking about a long haul or a medium haul aircraft, um, that's sort of where we're starting to look at. So we're looking at ducted fans of about three megawatts. Um, and you would have multiples of them like like this, this picture. It's got a bunch at the end. A bunch right. of I, that was another thing I was curious about. Um, I'm a RC aviation hobbyist and oh, generally, yeah. you know, that people go bigger propellers for more efficiency. It seems to scale with diameter. Um, is, is this sort of based on what an individual motor can handle with the current technology or? Um, this is coming out of work from NASA. Um, right. And what they, what they're doing, they've been playing this electric aircraft thing well, since I've started in cryogenics about 15 plus years ago. Um, and what they work out is that if you can distribute the propulsion and put it in the right place on the aircraft, it becomes um, overall more efficient. Right. So you so get maybe a they're more efficient flying plane. Yeah, flying. they may be yeah, they're offsetting the aerodynamic area. efficiency of the overall body, yep. what they're losing in uh, yep. disc efficiency, I guess. Yeah, right. I mean, on yeah, on your tube and wing plane, um, the bigger the diameter, the more area you get, the better propulsive efficiency, which is what's happening with the Rolls Royce and the current turbofan engines. Right, but they're looking and, at kind of yeah. a whole different paradigm, are they? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, there's there's quite a lot of different things happening in that space because propellers are bigger again but then propellers here aren't ducted fan and ducted fan is more efficient than a propeller um, for some things, but a propeller gives you more propulsive efficiency because of its size. Yeah. The, then you go supersonic on your propeller tip. And yes. Yeah. Apart. Once you run into compressibility issues on the yeah. blades, you pretty much have it and all the efficiency goes out the window. Yep. Yeah. I used to fly model aircraft in my youth. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> That's where other, all the aircraft people end up. Yeah. Other questions for Alan? Yep. Uh, maybe while we're waiting, I'll ask uh, maybe a more general one. Uh, mm -hmm. You've identified a number of challenges here. If you were forced to put your finger on the sort of the biggest sort of, I guess, barrier holding up this kind of innovation, where, where would you say that is? Um, there's a slight personal bias because of what I'm involved with, mm. but I think the cryogenics is one of the biggest technical barriers. Um, it's entirely likely that the cryogenic system will be bigger than the engine, the motor, mm. and heavier. Um, and if liquid hydrogen is the fuel of choice, then that takes care of that barrier very easily. Um, but if it's not and you have to go for a separate cryogenic plant, um, that's a huge barrier, getting the efficiency, weight efficiency and energy efficiency of that um, optimal. So I see that as a big barrier. The superconducting motors, um, there's been enough sort of technology readiness level three kind of proof of concept motors and even some motors that have actually got right up into full-scale demonstration um, to show that that's a technology that will be able to deliver. But keeping that technology as cold is a real challenge. And when you've got a rotating environment that you have to keep cold, that's even a, it's an even bigger challenge, which is part of what we're doing. So some real potential for, for co-benefits in terms of addressing those technological yeah. challenges. Yes, yeah. Yeah, everything's entwined mm -hmm. on an aircraft because weight is, is your sort of paramount um, criteria. And if you 
produce something that's too heavy, then you're in trouble. But it's, it's not all doom and gloom because, I mean, an aircraft does carry sort of like 120 tonnes of fuel when it takes off to go across the Pacific. So there's a little bit of weight you can play with. Uh, a question in the chat box from Paul. Do you want me to read it out or do you want to ask your question? Read it out. <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, so there's been no mention that hydrogen fuel will put water vapor into upper atmosphere, which is very significant for a warming potential. Do you have a comment on that? Um, I probably didn't cover that very well. I was trying to race through my slides. Um, in this slide here, the combustion, the H2O has the red arrow, which is the warming effect. And the contrails do have a warming effect. They, are, they can be significant. And the hydrogen powered plane will put more water into the upper atmosphere. So yes, is the answer. There's no such thing as a free lunch. This one uh, might be a bit of a silly question, but around the cryogenic side, um, yep. would the, uh, I know virtually nothing about cryogenics, um, so apologies if this is dumb, but would the cryogenic systems be likely to cause uh, sort of like ice buildup on the exterior of the aircraft from moisture condensing that could cause sort of airflow separation? Or would you not have that level of cold getting through the, the insulation? Yeah. Um, you just simply can't afford to let any moisture build up anywhere on cryogenic systems. Um, right. If you think about your typical heat pump with a COP of say a really good one at four or five, so you put one kilowatt in and to lift four or five watts or kilowatts of heat. Um, what you, I mean, a good, and if you think of those and you say, oh, my analogy is I'm lifting water out of the ground. Um, that's one where you're lifting water a short distance. So you can lift a lot of water very short with a fairly small pump. Um, but in cryogenics, what you've got is a well that is incredibly deep um, with an enormous winch on top. And the cooling penalty, you are expending somewhere around a kilowatt of energy to lift one watt of heat at um, 20 Kelvin, it's those sorts of numbers you're talking about. And because you're running on a, a ratio difference, so cold gets infinitely cold on the lo logarithmic scale. Um, and you've the drivers to reduce the heat load um, to as little as possible. So in the rotor, we're trying to cut heat load for this 100 kilowatt demonstrator down to sort of like 10 or 12 watts if we can. On the rotor, on the stator, we've got to deal with um, maybe a kilowatt of heat generated at 20 Kelvin, which would require, um, you know, 50 kilowatts or something at the compressor of a refrigeration plant, or maybe even 100 kilowatts, um, which is a lot of heat to lift that. So if you're looking at the um, the cold and liquid hydrogen, the latent heat there, you can use that. And there's actually enough latent heat in the hydrogen to generate the energy to um, power the sort of size motor. There's actually enough latent heat there. Bearing in mind that latent heat has to be taken out of the hydrogen at the airport before you fuel the plane to liquefy it. Um, so there's quite a lot of right. equations, so in but the terms answer of the, is yeah. no. I mean, you can right. get you can get um, cryogenic insulation down, so your insulation loss will be milliwatts. So if you kind of patted the outside of the casing of this thing, it wouldn't It'll be, be all especially cold to the touch, right? It'll be warm. Right, good. <laughs> so the so yeah. I guess cryogenically speaking, the energy budget of what's going on board the aircraft is a lot more than just what we've burned in the motor. It's also... Yeah. getting all that cold yeah. out, getting all that heat out yeah. of the cryo side. Yeah, right. but putting it into perspective, um, when you're talking about megawatts of motor and expending tens of kilowatts in a refrigeration plant. Right, it's a pretty is, small slice of the pie. 
It is, and it's still smaller than the resistive losses in a copper motor. Right, so hence why even bothering to cryo it in the first place. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, sometimes with copper, you can cryo the copper and the resistance losses make it worthwhile. So that is certainly, the jury is out whether that may be a, a useful intermediate step. Right. But the biggest thing with the um, superconducting motor and using superconductors is the size and weight. Um, it's because you can throw um, some of these, some of these sort of coils. I just want to get a sense of scale on some of these things. Um, where was that picture? These these tapes. Um, these Rebco tapes here have a one micron layer of um, superconductor on them. And uh, sort of like, I think, sort of seven or eight millimeters wide. And they can take a thousand amps with no resistance. Right. That gives quite um, an idea of scale. Uh, <laughs> Shoot. That, <laughs> that, that gives, a, that gives the, the idea of scale that you're talking about with superconductivity. So you can pack a lot more magnetic field, a lot more current into a tiny space. Right. Um, and the size comparison between a superconducting motor and a copper motor is huge. Um, right. And, you know, on, on ship size of things, um, you're talking hundreds of tons of copper you would save with a superconducting motor, just right. weight wise. So, so going forward in the next 10 years, is it likely mm -hmm. that any aircraft we see with copper engines will, will be down in kind of the Cessna size class? Or? Um, you, they exist. Right. So um, there's a, a, a company in Canada who has a float plane and they do short hops, um, sort of 100 kilometer short hops around the fjords where they operate. And I they think I've have seen just, that one, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and there's a, another company on the other side of the States who have got a similar small battery powered plane. Um, and they are um, permanent magnet type motors, quite compact, but, you know, standard um, ambient temperature motors. And what most people don't know is the motors were made in Christchurch. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, a few more, a few more yeah. questions in the chat box. Yeah. Um, I guess one first from Warren, just building off the... Uh, um, water vapor in the upper atmosphere asking is that offset by the reduction in co2 emissions of of not bur burning aviation fuel uh the answer is i can't answer that um i don't know that those numbers yeah. it would be a very interesting question to see if somebody's actually worked that out i'm sure somebody has um another question from murray um asking about uh sort of based on the energy return on energy invested um just asking, by the time this stuff gets up and running, uh, will it be too late? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, the latest National Geographic's got quite a good article, on, and this is one that arrived in my mail yesterday, um, quite a good article on electric aviation and what the aviation industry is doing. And um, their take, which I quite agree with is that it's probably going to be 10 or 20 years before we see this sort of technology hit large aircraft. Um, small aircraft and battery technology is going to come sooner, um, but greener fuels were also going to be part of the mix in the short, short to medium term. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how far it is, but this tech is definitely 10 or 20 years away from being implemented in the large aircraft. And I think once the regulations have sorted themselves out for a whole new load of technology, it might be a while before we see this flying every day. But it will fly every day. It'll be what replaces fossil fuels in the end. Uh, another question that actually flows on from that around uh, aviation safety and sort of David asks, as these things get more complex, is there a greater potential that something could go wrong? 
Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> there is, there is um, potential for things going wrong in complexity. Um, but if you look at the complexity of a gas turbine and what that needs to run, um, these are comparable and could be simpler. Um, but depends on what you're using to um, to generate the electricity. There are recent advances in fuel cells. They may replace gas turbines for converting the hydrogen to um, to electricity for an electric drivetrain. The electric drivetrain itself is a lot less com complex than a mechanical thermal drivetrain um, or prime mover. Um, so. Yeah, but we are thinking about complexity in the equation that we're dealing with, so it does come into it. And for the reliability in an aircraft, you've got to have redundancy as well. You know, what happens if one thing in your system fails? You know, does it all fall apart and the plane have to glide to a stop? You don't want that. <laughs> I suppose in that, in some regards, that's probably another advantage of smaller distributed propulsion, the lower yeah. impact of, say, a failure on one engine. Yeah, yeah. there's a, a really weird reliability equation um, that you do in statistics. I remember doing it way back, where at certain levels of reliability, it's better to have smaller numbers of motors on an aeroplane. A twin engine at a certain level of reliability is more reliable than four. And I think as you get more reliable, then it becomes better to have fewer. I think that is the way it went. All right, uh, we'll take, I think one last question yeah. from Karsten um, asking, does altitude and different ambient temperatures have an effect on how the cooling systems work? And I guess, would we change the way we fly or where that kind of thing? Um, the answer is yes, and it makes life a lot easier. Um, if you're warm temperature on your cooling system, so you're dumping your heat at minus 50 degrees Celsius, that's um, 250 Kelvin. If you're dumping heat at, or 220 Kelvin, um, that makes life a lot easier than dumping your heat at 300 Kelvin. Or if you're on an airport in the middle of Phoenix on a hot day, trying to get rid of your heat at um, 50 degrees above, <laughs> above that. So yes, it makes quite a difference, but it works for you in an aircraft. All right. Well, I guess that uh, that leaves it to me to to thank you very much, Alan, on behalf of OERC. I think that was a, a really fascinating presentation and sort of very forward looking. So, so thanks very much for taking the time. Uh, yeah. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, and a round of applause.